Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Linda V. Brown Kidd. I am the president of the Atlantic City Chapter of the Links Incorporated. I'm so, so happy to welcome you to this afternoon's program, a celebration of women in the arts. This program is in honor of Women's History Month and it, an extension of our 52nd Black Art Show, which was held last month through this month. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the magnificence of Black women's creativity. I'd like to introduce Sonia G. Harris, our chair of the Arts Facet. Sonia? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining the Atlantic City, New Jersey chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. We are delighted to present to you this afternoon a celebration of women in the arts featuring fine artists, Karen Y. Buster, ceramicist, Karen Clark, fiber artist, Kabibi uh, uh, Janku, and collage artist, Brianna Faulkner, who couldn't be with us this afternoon, but she sent a videotape, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. So we're going to ask each artist to tell something about themselves, how they got started, um, the type of art that, the beautiful art that they all uh, create. And we're going to start with our featured artist for our annual um, art show, Karen Y. Buster. Karen. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be back again. Um, I know I did a lot of talking last time, so I'm going to see if I can grab some points that I, I didn't make before. I've been in the business now as an, as an, as an artist uh, for the last 43 years professionally, starting when I was five, when things got started. Um, and have been doing this since that time. You guys had an opportunity at the show to see a lot of my black and white pieces that were in the gallery show. Um, I think I spoke to you to let you know that when you're looking at those pieces, I'm actually drawing with the knife. So everything you see was drawn with the knife. Um, since that time of just working with the black and white pieces, it, it has allowed me to kind of like stretch out and go in different directions. Some of the pieces that you didn't see at the show um, kind of catapulted from my graphic technique still working with just one utensil. I went from just working with the black and white pieces, working with the knife, to still working with another one utensil that could take it from just the graphics of being black and white to being able to work in something like this, which is actually copper. So, you know, you have the gamut. You can go from pillar to post in terms of actually what you can do once you have that idea. I think each of the, the women that are part of this show will show you all different kinds of uh, techniques in terms of how we come together to do our own thing. But in the same light, we still work together kept collectively, which is what this Women's Month is all about. And I can honestly say with the three women that I'm working with, it's not just a month, it's the entire year. So to go on to another facet of what I'm doing with my black and white pieces, step, step, stepping away from that and going in another direction. I showed you how I was working in copper, um, but I also work in metals. So something as simple as this, which is a garden state, being able to put myself in a position where you can go from inside the house to outside and decorating. Uh, this is another piece of steel, but my technique, lots of other, lot, lots of patterns. I'm a pattern woman. I love patterns. Um, you'll see, you'll see repetition in my patterns and everything that I do. Um, the garden states are, are something that's new for me. And I just work with my images again, you know, garden states. So you can actually be able to go from inside to outside to be able to add to the beauty of your home. We've been so uh, one-sided with basically just kind of putting things on the wall. I want it to come off the wall. So this was the idea of, of doing, doing, oops, sorry for the noise, doing again, 
garden sticks. Um, again, something that's new. Finally, going back in the house, you know, we have a tendency to, to sit back and, you know, I, I have art everywhere. I have it in the laundry room. I have it in the bathroom. I have it in the kitchen. I have it in the garage. I'm the kind of person, I like to walk around and see just work, whether it's my work or, you know, I collect all my friends' work, all the colleagues' work, you know, to have it everywhere. So you go from doing things like this is actually back in the day. I don't know if I'm telling myself. I don't know if you call it a turnabout or if you call it a lazy Susan. But again, where you can take something and use it as artwork and have it in your home and make it and make make it functional. Fortunately, the other thing I think has happened since I talked to you guys last, and you saw me last, I was actually um, blessed to be one of the featured artists in uh, Eddie Murphy's movie, Coming to America. Um, I was very pleased and proud of that. As you can see, I'm still grinning and we'll probably keep on grinning. You guys may have been familiar with the image itself, but... This is the image that was a part of that movie. So I say that to say the, the sky, the sky is a limit. The sky is a limit in terms of what you can do, where you can go, and what your work can do and how it can speak for you, can speak for you. Um, I continue, I continue to keep doing this as long as I can breathe, because for me, it is breathing. You know, I, I inhale and I exhale artwork. So I don't know if I've covered enough of the things that I needed to, and you guys will be open to be able to uh, ask me any kind of, any questions. I think we're gonna do it in between and at the end. So I'm, I'll be open to that. Not gonna hold, hog up the spotlight because the other three folk I got coming behind me are on point. Um, I don't know if there's anything else. I, I know one thing that you guys, should be familiar with, again, when I talk to you about the black and white pieces. This is what you, what you saw in point. So during this particular time of year, via the, 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 the pandemic and being social arrest and all the things that's going on, this has been an opportunity for me to um, relax my mind and work. It's also been an opportunity to be able to speak through our pieces and reach others. And I appreciate being put in a position and on this platform to continue to uh, show what happens with, uh, with the black women of America and the black artists of America. So I, I thank you for, for having me on the show. So now we will go to our next artist who is Karen. Mark, the ceramist. Hi guys, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hey Karen. Hey guys. Um, uh, Karen, it was a great introduction for all of us. I thank you. <laughs> but um, my name is uh, Karen Clark. I'm a ceramicist here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I started working in ceramics or clay uh, 24 years ago. And it's um, a very funny story. I started by, um, my background is culinary arts. And so I received a degree from that. And from there, um, I was watching PBS, which is our public broadcast system. Um, it was channel 23 in Richmond. Um, I saw a young lady, he was doing ceramics and uh, she had a school here in Richmond. And I called my mother and I said, hey, do you want to take this class? She said, yes. My mother became the two-year dropout, but she gave me all of her fabulous tools and so that I can continue to work and I've been thriving ever since. Um, but the reason why I wanted to do pottery in the beginning was to create plate sets and dining sets to pair with my food uh, when I was having um, parties at my home. Now I do not have one dining room set because everything else goes out to the world. So it's really a fun thing. But um, um, I started getting into sculpture um, after having the opportunity to be invited by Larry Poncho Brown and Karen Buster. And it was for the artists and art lovers. Our first trip was to Senegal 
And when we went there, um, we were not to do any art. We were just to absorb the culture. Um, after absorbing the culture and uh, doing an exit interview from Senegal, um, Pancho was my mentor at that time. And he says, so what will you do with this? And it took me about six months to a year to figure out what the direction I wanted to be in. And that was um, to have us see ourselves in ceramics. So if you travel throughout the world, you, uh, we already know that clay is the oldest craft in the world. But as far as seeing African-American faces or African diaspora faces or African faces, you don't get to see them that often. So you find them in Greece, but and you find them in Asian countries, but they're very, very few and far between. So I wanted to bring them into the States and, um, and show people what I do. So I kind of call it function with flair. It can be a piece that is very purposeful where you can use it every day, but it could also be a sculptural piece that um, you just have in your home. So I have one piece right here and I call these memory jars. And so all your memories for the year you place inside of the jar. And then a year later, you come back to look to see what um, you had done for the year or what you um, wanted to work on or what you've accomplished. And so that is what these are. A lot of people also use them as ceremonial um, pieces, um, but I like geometric design um, and you can find those in the Asian and African um, continents. Uh, and um, I also like to do the faces. I like open eyes and closed eyes and gold and storytelling throughout the faces. So I'm right now working on a story uh, with a storyteller from Manchester, England uh, to tell a story about one of the faces um, and so people can um, travel with us. Um, the other thing is um, I do functional pieces like mugs and so that people can drink out of these. And so um, it's, uh, they take time, but the, love is really uh, amazing and so I do things and so you can see mud cloth prints but also faces and then you can drink out of these you can put them in the microwave you can put them in the oven you can do so much so many things with functional pieces but what this has done for me is to allow me to go back to a European country and then go back to the continent to allow me to do more investigation to um, to research and so that I can bring it back here and so that it can be used again. Um, but uh, I don't think that I, I think I talked too fast. I hope, uh, <laughs> I, um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else I can let you guys peek at. Oh, one thing that you guys can peek at, which is really, really fun, which are teapots and using sweet grass from South Carolina um, and putting and making the reeds themselves and then also putting a face on there. And so it's kind of nice to have, to be able to see yourselves and see the geometric design, but also have function to it where you can sit down with friends and pour a cup of tea. I'll bring that up a little closer, but um, I like to work with color and design and faces. And um, it's fun to figure out um, doing a bunch of pieces, how many hairstyles you can do in a day. <laughs> but thank you for having me. And if you guys have any questions um, on the back end, please let me know. Thank you so much, Khabibi. Your work is beautiful. Uh, and I just wanna let the audience know, if you have any questions for any of the artists, uh, you can type them in. And when we do get to the end, we, we're definitely gonna address um, all your questions and have our artists uh, answer them. Now we're going to move to Kabibi uh, uh, Janku. Had a problem with that word. Uh, uh, Janku, who is a um, fiber artist. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Kibibi Ajanku, that is who I am. You did not do badly with my name. Thank you very um, much. <laughs> I am a fiber artist and I am a fiber artist 
that, that does many, many things. So I, I actually, more people know me as an African dancer. And so what you see is an evolution um, from my life as an African dancer and a director of a dance company and in responsible for uh, acquiring fabric and making and designing and building costume sets and backdrops um, that are not only the dancing costumes, but the dancing masks and the, the all, all kinds of, of things. So this is an evolution from there. My life as a fiber artist is an evolution from there. It is also an evolution that is um, part of my legacy. My grandmother was a quilt maker and my father was the, um, the student of Dr. George Washington Carver, who was also a fiber artist. We don't know that, but he was a fiber artist that worked with natural plant-based dyes like indigo. And so where I am now is I think where I belong and I could not be anywhere else. Like uh, Karen Buster and Karen Clark, my legacy as an artist started early, early, early. I started dancing when I was three years old. I started sewing when I was 11 on the sewing machine. When I was nine, I started working with fabric, fiber, and, and uh, knitting needles um, and crochet needles at, at the age of nine. So all of these things are kind of a convergence, right? Now you see me working with dyes, working with fabric, working with paper and collage, working with things that are soft sculpture like dolls and 2D uh, images like uh, collage work that as you see in the back. Um, I am currently very, very, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. So I'm, I'm uh, I wanted this to be very kind of organic and comfortable. So um, if I invite the audience to ask questions about anything that I've touched upon, upon that I haven't dived deeper in, you see me wearing this blue and you see that many of the items behind me and around me are um, having this blue kind of energy. This blue, is an energy all in of itself. It is a natural indigo dye. I'm fascinated with it because I love the blues. I love the color. I love the feeling of it. Yes. So I love the look of it, the feeling of it, the energy of it, but I'm fascinated with it because it is a direct connection to West Africa. West Africa, was the place that indigo, this indigo journey in America actually came from. The slave trade was forever changed by the, by indigo as a cash bearing crop during uh, chattel slavery. And during that time, Africans were stolen, kidnapped, trafficked, and utilized now, you're not supposed to say any of those things about human beings. We know that, right? But I say them quite intentionally because that is what happened. Utilized for the work and the profit of indigo. And there was a time in this country where indigo rivaled cotton in regard to income, right? That's pretty mind boggling because we hear about cotton. What we don't hear about is this indigo. And when we talk about indigo today, we hear about it from the standpoint of Asia. Now, I'm not here to take you on a historical mission, but I am touching upon it because I think that my work is not only that understanding of the past with an influence of how I work presently, but I think those two things coming together in the word I like to use is convergence. Those past and present energies coming together create a healing for the future. And God knows we need a healing right now, right here, right now, we need a change. The world is as crazy as it can be. 
and there's negativity and frustration in every direction. So I think about my work as some kind of healing, some kind of messaging. I think about my work as bringing together understanding an energy that is born out of the past, sometimes out of difficult stories, sometimes out of golden stories and the richness and the wonder and the beauty of Africa into however it comes through me. And like Karen Buster said earlier, and like Karen Clark touched upon, you'll see that our work comes through us very, very differently. Our inspiration, if, we, if you move yourself out of the way, then we get a chance to, to, to share what comes through us. And that is the healing that this world needs, you know? Artistry is that thing that creates beauty, that inspires di dialogue, and that um, is a, an, a, can affect and affect change, I think, as well. So that's pretty much my story. Um, what do I have around? We're talking about healing. I'm going to step away from this chair. And uh, let's, let's go here. This is kind of a mixed media piece. It's got some fabric. It's got some paper. It is called Florida. I was recently, um, I recently did a residency in Sarasota, Florida, and I did some collage works, works that are 2D, works that are on canvas, works that include a, a variety of mediums to include paper, acrylic, and fabric. And so this is, these are kind of like market ladies. As you see, my work is very ethnically charged, I like to say. It is very influenced by my love for Africa. And so I, uh, we get to see ourselves in the work, I think. And so, you know, we see this palm tree of Florida and some sun and some sun hats. And of course, if we are women of the, of the, of the thing, of, we got to have some red lips, right? We got to have some big old red lips. It is the beauty of the us. So this piece is entitled Florida. Uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit. This, if you can see, I'll move my chair, is a piece that I, it's a work in progress. And it has some upcycled denim and some indigo from the dye vats that I have been cultivating over the year some wax batik, which is straight out of the tradition, out of Yoruba tradition. It is called Adire um, Oniko. And it, uh, what I've done is kind of in the tradition of plantation patchwork stitchery, stitched bits and pieces of denim from family members and from loved ones. And so the stitching and the moving together of these pieces kind of took me on a journey of a memory kind of based journey that just made me smile and think about hard times and easy times and, and, and clear times and cloudy times, right? So this is a work in progress. It's unnamed and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's moving right up above it you see a piece that is out of the Sarasota collection. And it's, again, got paper and fabric, and it's got some indigo work, um, some batik work. It's called Drum Talk. This is a, a, a mask, and, and it is because the drum is that thing that can carry a message, and that message, uh, much like a cell phone, can travel for miles and miles and miles. So that is called drum talk. Um, if you go in this direction, angels watching over. And one of my soft sculpture pieces, she is a doll. She's entitled Indigo Magic. You see, she's a dancer. You can tell she's a dancer. You see those toes, right? But she is a dancer that is inspired by the spirit of Africa. So she's kind of new world, old world. She's got some denim raffia and she's got some Bantu knots out of denim. Uh, 
I have been working on a series of spiritual totems. And so this is a wooden piece. It began like everything I'm doing right now in my indigo vat. So this wood was submerged and soaked and, 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 and absorbed the essence of Africa from the West African indigo vat. And it's got some Ankara African fabric. It is um, got this crown as symbols of royalty. It is very much kind of a past, present, futuristic, Afrofuturistic. So it's got kind of these these tendrils that is, uh, you know, are they connections to another place? Are they sending and receiving messages? We just don't know. And this is called Obia. Yeah? And then lastly, this also was a piece that began in my indigo vat. It is a mortar and pestle. It was carved in a village called Bop, right in Senegal, very close to Dakar, Senegal. And this uh, mortar, like I said, and the pestle began in the indigo vat. I started this at the beginning of the pandemic because mortars, pestles are those things that not only crush the food that feed us and keep us healthy, but also crush and mix the medicines of the earth. So this cauldron is a healing kind of metaphor for this pandemic. And... I think that might be it for my tour, my studio tour, if you will. Thank you so much. Um, and again, if there are any questions to be asked, I'll feel free and I'd be glad to answer them. We, we certainly will, and we already do have questions, but what we're gonna do now, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Khabibi. I'm not gonna say your last name, I'm just gonna say Khabibi. <laughs> Uh, but what we're going to do now, the young lady that wasn't, she uh, she had an emergency and could not be with us today, but she did take the time to uh, film a short clip. So we'll do that. And uh, then we'll come back uh, and speak with Karen. Karen with a C, Karen with a K, and you, uh, uh, more about your art and um, the other questions that uh, our guests have posed. So we're going to, uh, uh, if Mr. Chapman would now put the clip up with Brianna Faulkner. She's an emerging artist that does collages, collage art. Um, I, we're unable to hear it, or at least I am. Materials to archive and tell the stories of Black women. So much thanks to Lynx Inc. for sharing their platform to bring greater representation to our narratives, um, for generating more revenue uh, opportunities and, and entrepreneurial opportunities, and to help build the brands of women of color. When I say that I make work that tells the story of black women, it's as simple as that. Um, I remember being a kid and literally only drawing pictures of the things that I wanted to see hanging up in my own home. I wanted to have complete creative control. And I remember being a little girl and going to the library and getting Tar Beach by Faith Ringhold. And that book is so important to me even today because the pictures were just so beautiful and vibrant. And um, Faith Ringhold, she uses quilts um, to as pictures. And literally, each piece of the quilt told its own story. And I remember just being mesmerized by that. There was um, there's also a part of the book where the main character is flying. That was like the first time I'd ever seen a black girl fly on paper. And that image meant so much to me. And in a way, it kind of gave me permission to just make anything that I wanted to. I would say I'm very much 
I'm still an analog girl in the digital world. When it comes to my process, it's magazines, it's books, it, it's a mess. It's things everywhere of the chaos, of the, the flipping through pages, the tearing. It's just, it's not, it's not a very tidy place to be in my studio when, I, when I'm in the process of making work. But it's all about the searching and the seeking. It's about the finding. It's about having faith that those little pieces are there. They're going to come together and it never fails. I always find what I'm looking for. Um, and so it's almost just me taking the images um, of the things, of the types of images of black women I see and repurposing and reimagining them, uh, giving them more of an empowered position. Um, lifting them from pages and making them as mystical and mythical as I want, to, want them to be. So, no, I don't think I'll ever stop making stories about Black women. Um, I went to art school. I have seen so many books, so many images, um, watched a lot of TV, seen a lot of movies. And I think not until recently did I feel that we were getting to a place where our voices um, were being honored publicly. And so there's still a lot to tell. There's still a lot of things that are yet to be seen. Um, and it's exciting. It's exciting. And so um, a lot of those things you'll see in my work. Unfortunately, I am not able to be with you all this afternoon. However, I am honored to have been uh, invited to participate in this occasion. I know the other three women who are featured, uh, who are being featured this afternoon, and they are powerhouse uh, people, creatives, whose spirits and work continue to inspire me and my practice. To see more of my work or to place an order, you can visit my website at www.b-faulkner.com or you can follow me on Instagram at bfaulknerart. That was absolutely lovely. Her work, her work is beautiful. So let me wrap back around to Karen Y. Buster. Uh, Miss Buster, as I mentioned earlier, was our featured artist for our annual Black History uh, Art Show. She did a wonderful job. And let me just throw this in, in there real quick. We are, our very creative uh, president was able to make a flip book of all her art. So if anyone is interested in seeing the full, well, you can, you can see it on YouTube, but you can also see each individual piece in a book that was created. So feel free to put uh, your email and, or, your, or your text. We will send it to you um, either way, but her, her work is, is magnificent. So the first question I have for you, Miss Buster, um, and I, I do believe I asked the same question, but wait, hold on, she gave it to me. And, okay, here it is. Uh, what motivated you to create fine art for 35 years after starting out in a t-shirt business? You're muted, Karen. All right. <laughs> what started me, catapulted me from one to the other. Um, the the t-shirts were which was wearable art um, really allowed me to see how my images could could walk around and I I was introduced to a whole nother platform in terms of to another layer of what I could do from one of my uh, best friends and or mentors back then uh, Larry Poncho Brown who was uh, also a fine artist. And he would just tell me, he said, you know, my t-shirt line was Buster Ties and it take off between my last name Buster and advertising. If you were wearing my garments, then you were Buster Ties. And the whole thing was for me to make you ask a, a question. Well, and, and that was fine in terms of the, sh into the t-shirt world, but there was such another 
huge world in terms of the fine arts that I needed to step into. I needed to not be uh, bustertizing the t-shirts, but now become Karen Y. Buster, the artist doing, doing the fine arts aspect. So it really was, um, it, was a, it was an easy step from the aspect of creating because my style did not change. But what I did was I just enhanced it more and more and more. So my collectors just came from another level um, that I knew nothing about. I really knew nothing about because I was I was really just on that one side. And once and once I stepped on the other side and I and I began to meet colleagues and see artists and know I have I've seen their work and didn't know the person behind it and put a, a, a face and a name to an image, it was the kind of thing It's like, okay, I understand now why I need to show my work as the artist Karen Wildbuster. So that's how I kind of went from doing my tees to stepping into the fine art. But that's what started me with the, the entire thing was that t-shirt rim of working with that for, I guess, probably the first 20 years and then the next, uh, 23 years was into fine arts and working as a fine a fine artist. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a follow-up question to that question. I had to keep going back to my phone. Um, and everybody knows I'm a little low tech. Um, you have several pieces of artwork. Is there a particular series that inspires you the most? Um, I think one of, well, I, I have, I have, I can't say one per se over other. Um, I think anything musically, my, my New Orleans necktie series, um, these are all facets of my life. I spent 10 years in living in New Orleans. So the, the whole musical side of me comes from that where everything is so whimsical and and there's a lot of um, movement in my pieces. Um, then I can step into uh, going to, to Senegal. And when I went to, to Africa and I had an opportunity to just see a whole nother uh, uh, facet of, uh, of, of, of people, life and culture that made me um, come, come back to the States and say, I need to tweak some things. And then I just started doing my Senegal, Senegal women. And then, then from there, I went from wanting to see um, my images from being on flat matter against the wall to being um, um, three-dimensional, to be able to be upright, to be able to be um, sculptures, to be able to take them and to be able to turn them around from all three sides which was different than what I was used to doing. So I think that um, the most important thing that has to happen is the growth, continue, continue to grow, continue to reinvent that wheel to show something that, that's different, that keeps, that keeps, of course, your collectors hungry, but more important than keeping your collectors hungry, it has to keep you hungry. I'm in the process now of just stepping into into the virtual world, which you talk about, you not being tech. <laughs> Woo -hoo. It's a whole nother thing, but it allows me to reach back to young people who know it all to, to bring them to, for us to merge that gap and bring their art into my art and us just kind of like come together and, and make it work. So I think um, you can learn something from anybody, any age, at any time. Every time you open up your eyes, there's another picture. Every time I close my eyes, there's another dream. So it never, ever stops. Wonderful. Um, this this uh, last question, well, not the last for the afternoon, but the question I wanna ask you right now, how do you decide the art that you create? Is it based on what's happening in society or random thoughts come to your mind and you use thoughts, ideas for your creativity? It's all of the above. It's all of the above. I did uh, three uh, uh, cancer pieces surrounding my mom having cancer. 
Back in the day, I did a piece where um, I actually broke my leg and I have an image riding around on a, a, in a chair, pushing herself around with the cast. Well, that's what I did in my studio. I had to keep working. Um, I may go outside and I may see a march and I'm like, okay, I need to be able to recreate that. So every day, every, anything and everything can inspire me to work or to create. I don't think there's any, uh, there's no blockage. There's, it's just a matter, like I say, I, I'll dream it or I'll see it. You say it and I can see it. So it's just all kinds of little things that just come together to, to bring my illustration and my, and my, and my images um, to life. The main thing is that I'm able to um, do something that allows me to speak to you and allow you to look at it and speak back to me. Thank you. I'm gonna to pivot to Karen Clark for a moment and ask a question that's somewhat similar to the one I just asked you, Karen, with the K. Um, does your work reflect the current societal dilemmas, dilemmas Karen? Um, well, yes and no. Um, um, I have some things that do um, when I'm inspired, um, but also um, I'm inspired by what, what comes into me by research. Uh, so, um, but um, the series that I have that is out there now is um, an angel series. And uh, my mom actually gave that to me saying that uh, we need angels right now to watch over us. And so I have been working on those right now. Wonderful. Um, we, we were privy uh, before the show even started that you went outside to your kiln and mm -hmm. you had the larger pieces. It was almost mm -hmm. a, and a body. What mm -hmm. were those pieces? Uh, um, I'm sorry? No, that was it. What were those pieces that? Um, oh, those were um, just inspiration. I am also a teacher of clay. So I am also in my own gallery and then I'm in my studio, but I also go to a, another studio to teach people. And so I was teaching them form. Um, and after we taught the form, they have, you know, when you're dealing with clay, um, you have to think about your process from the very beginning to the end. And so you can throw the pieces, which is fine, but what happens after then, after that? Do you sculpt in it? Do you carve in it? Do you leave it the way that it is? Uh, because you only have one chance to make a decision to allow it to go back in the water to dissolve where you can re-wedge it and make something else or it goes into the fire. And once it's been vitrified, that is it. It goes in, you can only put color on it or it goes into the trash can, you break it up and put it in the trash can. So with those pieces, I, I was throwing them. It wasn't my style, but those were uh, things that students wanted to create. And so I said, how do I make this my own? And for Women's Month, I said, oh, I think I'll create bodies um, of women. So it was a, a fun journey. It, didn't great, it was a great experience. I'll probably do a couple more um, in um, Ebony. And then um, after that, I think I'll be finished with that series for a while. So the mask on the walls to my right, which would be to your left behind you, you created mm -hmm. as well. Could you talk about yes, that? Oh, uh, yes, um, I did create those. Uh, the one at the top, that was dealing with the Queen series and I was embellishing it with um, copper and using pigment, um, pigment wax. And then the other one was a process that I was doing for um, a creed quarantine that I had in January. So it was 12 other artists that were supposed to be together, but due to the pandemic, we had to work in our own uh, separate studios. Um, so uh, Poncho and I uh, created what they call an alcohol resist to create that design in the face. Um, and that is doing three different layers of um, acrylic and then using rubbing alcohol to actually make it sell on top of it. So it was a great experience to be able to work with other artists um, and create these um, interesting bodies of work together. 
So perhaps some 30 years ago, I, I did ceramics, but the kind where everything's done and you just paint it and you go about your business. But now the piece on the table um, that you showed us early, the memory. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you add the faces later or like what's the process? Um, the process is, um, it takes a couple of weeks. So usually when I'm doing these, I usually do about nine or 12. It takes about two weeks to process them. So you throw the vessel itself. I'll bring it up closer. So the vessel itself is thrown. This is the vessel. The lid is part of the vessel. Then after that's done, then it has to be trimmed. And that means that this is really wide at the very beginning. And then I have to taper this down. Then from there, I have to make a decision of, does it stay smooth or do I put texture in it? So I put geometric design inside of the piece. Mm -hmm. And then once that happens and it's um, firm enough, what we call greenware, that is when I create the face separately, do the attachments, and then I roll each individual piece of hair. So that's hundreds of pieces of hair onto a piece, on her, to her face. Then it goes in for what they call the first fire. The first fire is to vitrify all of this to make sure that everything is stable. When it comes out, then I have to use a natural pigment like uh, Kabibi, where she's using indigo. I use iron to put it onto the face. And iron is just glorified rust, believe it or not. From there, um, I, put, I have to wax resist this and so nothing can touch it. And then I actually put color onto the body of the piece. Then it goes into the fire to receive its color. So it takes about, um, the first fire is 2000 degrees. The second fire is uh, 2600 degrees. It cools down, I, it comes out. Then I have to look at the piece to make sure that it's okay. Then from that, it goes into the third fire to get 14 karat gold and white gold into Beautiful. its areas. And Beautiful. then after it comes out, then I make a decision of whether or not it's for sale or does it go into under my memory tree at home? <laughs> <laughs> so oh. it is a part. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. It is a process. So doing 12 of them at a time can be a bit overwhelming, um, but um, they definitely speak to you and tell you what they want. Uh, two questions just pop up popped up. Mm -hmm. One was, um, does Karen make cookie jars? And the other is, uh, can you custom the teapot, teapots, I guess, customize them? Yes, yeah. I can custom teapots and I, I can make a cookie jar for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so who are your, who are you most, who are your most prominent influencers? Um, it's, um, prominent influencers um charles smith um he's down in alabama he is my ceramicist mentor um i have never met him before in my life um but um many years ago i sent him a photo and he critiques my work still to this day to tell me how he feels about my work and it's very um, it's amazing but also the other ceramic artists that i've worked with over on the continent have been inspirational. Um, so dealing with um, the older, uh, older ceramicists that are out there, you know, because they have a lot of stories and a lot of techniques um, that will wow you, you know, because in the ceramic world, they try to make things easy, but they, you know, they don't realize that some of the uh, techniques that were, that are being, were being used are probably some of the easier techniques to make, to give it more of a wow form. Um, and, and I just want to remind everyone that we're putting the artist's uh, email uh, and website addresses in our chat. So if there's anything that you see, um, and I see a lot, that uh, <laughs> sparks your interest, uh, definitely you can reach out um, to these uh, fabulous artists. The last thing I'm going to ask you with, because I'm just looking at everything behind you. So mm -hmm. the lamp. So yes. you, you made the base for the lamp and then created the lamp? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you talk about so that I, a little bit? Um, so creating the lamp, um, it's the same um, process, creating the form, allowing it to dry, 
and then adding the face on. Um, and then after it's gone inside of the fire, then I actually um, put the hardware onto the piece and so that it can have the proper connections um, to be the lamp. Oh, your work is beautiful. Thank you, uh, I appreciate I'm, it. I'm gonna pivot to, um, to Kabibi for a moment. And, and let me start with the same question to you, uh, Kabibi. Does your work reflect the current societal dilemmas? Um, I, I, I have to say yes and no. I mean, I'm very, very influenced by the world around. I'm very, very influenced by past, present, and what our future can be, the possibilities of the future. So in that way, um, I have to be open not only to the looking back, but the looking around, the landscape. So, so I guess that would be a yes answer. Okay. Um, and who, who are your most prominent influencers? Broad. <laughs> Faith Ringgold is a great influence to me. People know her for her quilt making, but she also is a, is a, a multifaceted artist. So she's got work that is, it has, is shown in gallery and in 2D dimensions, work that is, is painted, work painted, that is work that is, she's got work that is coming from a lot of different directions. And so she is very freeing to me. It lets me know that I do not have to, that it's not necessarily a pivot to work in several different directions. It can be all that I am. Um, Henry O. Tanner, who is deep from our history, he is a man, a painter, the first black man uh, to have his work shown in the Louvre. His work is in the gallery at Hampton University. And he uh, um, was an oil painter prior to the end of slavery. And his portraiture is amazing. It is like you can walk into a scene when he, he's, it, one of his famous works is the, uh, mm, the banjo player. And it is like you can sit down next to this man and this little boy and listen to the music. It's that realistic. So, so, but the inspiration of what it must have taken to envision your, envision himself as a black man outside of slavery and to persevere and to, you know, when all we know about that time is blight and horror. So that he is inspirational and speaks to possibility for me. But all the way juxtaposition, I have to add a third, uh, Basquiat, um, just in regard to Afrofuturism, just in regard to future, just in regard to, again, persevering against all odds and to remember that, that life will throw you curveballs and will um, take you as an artist and make you a crazy person if you let, let this life around you. So to just stay uh, true to the fire and not to be afraid to experiment and to um, touch things that are just common and turn it into cre creative beauty. I have a question here. Where did where did you how did you learn so much about indigo? You, you spoke about indigo, the color. Travel. I mean, travel. Africa is. In 1996, I was in Africa. I had taken a group of artists to train a group of my artists for dance and for drum. I also was there. Part part of my my effort there was to acquire um, fabric for costuming. So I was in a village in the Gambia and I was visiting with a group of emerging artists, fiber artists who were going to make this uh, and design this fabric that I had an indigo scene in mind. And um, I, so I'm in the village and they're working on this fabric. And that was the first time that I saw the fabric 
come out of the vat green, the air hit it, and it turned a magical, beautiful blue. It was on after that. I, I've never <laughs> turned away from indigo, you know, after that. And that was in 1996. Um, more recently in uh, 2019, I spent, I believe in, in, in entrenching yourself in artistry. So you, you hear Karen Clark and Karen White Buster talk about their travels, their journeys to Africa and, you know, and how you have to let the creativity wash over you and be inspired by it. So there are times that I will go places just to do that. There'll be times that I'll go places just to lock myself away to just be open to creativity. In, 19, in 2019, I went to Oshogbo, Nigeria, and I spent a month at the Nikkei Arts Center. Um, I assigned myself um, to an elder um, traditional indigo dyer and just um, steeped myself, just kind of walked in the footsteps and did uh, traditional Yoruba Adire dye practice with the dye resist, the whole nine yards. And so, um, yeah, uh, I, I've, I've learned a lot over time and there's much more to investigate and interrogate and be inspired by. Did I see, I went on your website, did I see that you had a beaded piece for a dancer? Someone had, it was beautiful. So you also do beading work, for lack of a better term. I do. I, I, um, I do. Um, yes, is the answer. <laughs> it was, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. I love, beautiful. Beads. I, love I love, uh, I love beads. I love beading. Maybe you can describe it a little bit for, for our, um, um, I think it was, was, it, was it the one with cowrie shells? Was it? Yes. Yes. It, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so cowrie shells are, are a fiery inspiration to me because at one point in time, cowrie shells were used as a form of currency, as a form of money. So if you were really rich, you had lots and lots of cowrie shells, the chiefs, you would see, you can still see sometimes historical images of chief from days gone by and they've got shoes of cowrie and pants and they're they're sitting on a, a big throne and it's all cowrie because they were rich right mm -hmm. and so the very very poor people had none so that you know is that is something that kind of we are the fruit of the earth we are the the gold and the, the treasure of this America that we stand on. America stands on the work that that our forefathers put in place, the builders, the 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 farmers, the makers, the all of those things. So we are the richness of the land, and that's what the cowrie means for me. Mm -hmm. And so you see cowrie shells in a lot of my work. Yeah, yeah it was beautiful. I'm I'm going to let my colleague and um member of my art facet, uh, pose some questions that are uh, in our webinar feed. Uh, we also are delivering this, um, this afternoon, this program, uh, Facebook Live as well. But um, uh, Ms. Bailey, Ellen Bailey, will pose some questions and, and then we'll come back. Thank you so much, Sonia. So we have a, a few questions. I'm going to start with a question um, asked earlier by uh, Alpoy Tolliver, uh, and this is for uh, Kabidi. She said, I love all of this, especially the blue energy. Can you talk about your process in making your collage pieces? What inspires a piece? How do you go about choosing and placing your images together? When did you first begin collaging? And what do you look for to know that a piece is complete? and or what it's supposed to be. <laughs> I know there's a, there's a lot there. So really everybody, I guess the, the question is, everybody wants to know, how do you come up with these uh, amazing pieces? 
I have to say, well, first of all, I, I surround myself by things that inspire me, by, by, by elements that inspire me. The, the indigo, making the, the dye vat is in itself an art form and an artistry. And, you know, you can have bad days and not so wonderful day, good days, great days. The, the dye can be anything from this deep, deep blue, which is um, from Oshogbo, and is difficult to achieve in this part of the world, this deep, deep blue, um, to the, this kind of blue, which is my, my most recent vat, this is kind of the deeper range from that. So I'm inspired by the vat and the blues that come out of it in and of itself. I love to, to, to play with designs and, and make small swatches. And then they go into my um, collage work. Um, I am inspired by place. This is from Florida. I'm inspired by sound, drum talk. I, I think whatever I dream, I see, you know, I think both of the Karens talked about letting the work speak or sometimes going to sleep and seeing a whole piece or sometimes talking to someone and they say, you know, those angels are watching over, do something with some angels. You know, it, 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 it comes from so many different directions. The idea is to just be open, you know? Thank you. And so pivoting to um, Karen, Karen, Karen with the C first, um, what's the process for making customized pieces? Do you need to meet the individual or do you use a photograph? Um, I actually just make a phone call um, to the client and we talk about um, what it is that they're looking for. So when I do customized pieces, I like to have liberty to be able to create um, because sometimes clients think that this is what they want, but usually when I do several different pieces and I do the one that they really want, they don't want that piece. They usually want the second or the third or maybe even the fourth piece. Um, so, um, um, the process is you give me a call, we have a discussion, I do three pieces, you look at the three pieces and you make a decision from there is um, how the commission process works for me. And if I can pivot to uh, Kay Karen, um, I, I want to start with you. One of the earlier questions was, do you, any of the faces belong to people you know or have seen? Um, particularly your works, I think uh, the question came up early during your presentation, um, and it's fascinating because they're outlines, but um, the question about the, are they, you know. Some, some of the pieces that I do, um, like I say, my Senegal women are women that I actually saw in Senegal, not that I, I had a, a photograph of them that way, but I had one this way. And, um, you know, with creating those, I think what I saw most was the, the strength in those women. So when I go back to recreate what I saw, that's how I try it and bring it out. Um, when you go into uh, likenesses of people that you know, uh, uh, President Obama, Prince, um, some of the, my jazz pieces, they also are going to be likeness of of the individual, or oh, that's the only way you're gonna know who it is. So um, I've been able to do a likeness of somebody and I've been able to also create my own people. And I think everybody looks like somebody. So it's, it's funny because I will always get asked, is that so-and-so or is that so-and-so? And, -so? and I'm, I would say, well, who do you see? And that takes it back to it being art. <laughs> and listening to your description of that, uh, I know that when Linda and I were talking about your Senegalese women, um, and I, I want to get the whole set, they, it, you see the strength in it. That was the one that the, how we both described, and we were talking about the different parts of the series, but so, so thank you. That comes, that comes through viscerally. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Karen and Khabibi, the same thing with you are the um, faces 
Are they uh, faces that you see, whether mentally or that you see in your surroundings for some of the pieces that you create? You want to go first or me? Yep, you can go first, uh, Khabibi, okay. Khabibi or Karen. <laughs> go ahead, Karen. Okay, great. Um, um, I do stylized um, faces, but I'm pulling from everywhere. So it could be somebody's lips that I like, someone's nose, somebody's cheekbones, someone's hairstyle. It's all, you know, it's a whole a bunch of people put in one piece. Um, so it's not really a person, but it could look like somebody who favors someone. And Khabibi? My work is, the it, if there are faces, they're stylized. I mean, but in general, it is about the energy of that whole thing rather than the, the face that I'm going for. So, uh, you know, my work might have just lips or it might have just beads or it might have no face at all. And then recently I've been working on a series of dolls that all have one large cowrie in the center of the face and beads surrounding that large cowrie. So, you know, it is definitely a stylized kind of um, face. Uh, the last question that we had uh, posed in the Q&A was um, from Katura Jackson, and she said, I have a friend who is a Vietnam vet who has been doing art in, uh, indicative of the war. What should he do to get started in the art world? And any of you can uh, please feel free to chime in to answer that. It, it, it sounds like he's already gotten started because he's doing the work. And that is the beginning to uh, remain uh, uh, compliant and creative. Um, there are ways to get in the art world by showing your pieces. Um, the more piece, the more people that are uh, familiar with your work, then they'll they'll know your work. They'll know your style. The three of us all have different styles, but after this event, I'm sure that any of the, the members can see the work somewhere else now and know the artist behind it. It's the same thing for this gentleman. He has to just continue to, to, to create and then find platforms to be able to show it, be it social platforms. I mean, I remember when I started, everybody that knew me, family member, cousin, sister, or friend wore a shirt because that was my audience to go after. And then from there, it reached out and going to, you know, as, as people started paying attention to the work, then I was able to go and introduce myself to, to the rest of the world the same way. So um, he's already in the right direction, which is to continue to create. Thank you. Uh, Karen or Khabibi, um, do you have any words of wisdom as well for, for this young man? Um, Karen said it all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there is, there is art and that's the beginning, the middle and the end. It's the through line. And, it, you know, so, you know, Karen said that. And then there's the business of art. And that's always a conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but. <laughs> it's always like this carrot on a stick and you're just forever reaching for it, you know? Yeah, yeah. You I mean, and that's, and that's important. That is very important because um, speaking for myself, I mean, I mean, I just saw my tax agent today to cover up, to make sure that I was on point with, 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 with the business of art. So it, it will spiral from being the hobby and the thing to do to become the business. And you know, if I could have done anything differently in my career was to start the business side of things so much earlier, so much earlier, because that, that is the one thing I think that makes the difference with anybody um, that goes into this field. If you're gonna step into that world of being able to show and sell, then there needs always to be documentation that you sold it, documentation, that you receive payment for it and documentation that you can show the government. 
and the work you're just gonna work you know is it you know people think that artists sit around and twiddle their thumbs and just do pretty things you it's a, the grind is real the grind is real and i i i you know you heard karen clark talk about one vessel that takes two weeks and about by she she also mentioned doing a dozen at a time but do you think that her life is just um oh i can sit here and have just one thing in two weeks and maybe one client will want one of those pieces no because if you look at karen's shop her her workshop you might see 60 mugs that also are in play, you, you know? Um, and all three of us work other places as well. The grind is real. You know, you have to love what you're doing so much that you're willing to work for it. And I would also say that young man to, um, I've always said innovative people motivate me. Um, I keep myself around innovative, around innovative people. We all know each other. We all talk to each other. We did not plan to wear blue today. It happened. It really happened on its own. Those <laughs> little things that pop up, that's just another part of the connection of who, who we are. And you don't even know it happens. So if, if, if Khabibi's having a bad day because she can't figure anything out, can't have a bad, maybe I'm having a good day and I can talk to you and, 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 and flip it. If we're in each other's space and nothing is being said, but those juices can happen. And now via COVID, we're not even in each other's space. So now we got the Zoom, we have to talk, we have to FaceTime, we have to show them however it needs to happen. He just put himself in a position that he can also uh, talk to uh, other 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 like artists um, to help him with his inspiration and his direction. Thank you. Is there um, for and this is a question for all of you? Is there any medium that you haven't worked in yet that's on your to do list? <laughs> um, actually, I am taking a welding class, and I am um, actually taking a painting class, um, and I do those on Tuesdays. So um, the learning never stops with artists. So we're always doing something. So and then the next month I'll be working in resin um, for the next for the next month because you're always trying to um, think outside of the box, but you're always trying to, you know, you look at your work and you go, so what else can I do? How, how can I stretch myself? So it's, it's always a learning, learning journey with um, art. Fantastic. We can't wait to see what you come up with uh, in oh. the mediums. <laughs> Khabibi, Karen, what's, what's on your, your medium wish list? My next, um, on my next, I'm there, I'm pretty, you know, I told you this indigo is a thing. It's so I do that dyeing. So I create designs and dip them into a bucket of dye, if you will. That's the vat dye. I, I have not really done much in regard to paint, taking a really rich, deep, deep pigment and painting it on to a dye resist and and so i'm i i'm planning a trip in some time in south carolina in the low country and i'm gonna hang out with my 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 batik sister and just do dye resist with wax and paint on fabric for a few weeks upcoming in uh, may so that's next on my list I am I am open probably to any and everything that allows me to um, take my my style of work and create it in another poem. You know, I'm interested in um, one of the things I've always wanted to do was to blow glass. Um, um, glass blowing to me when I see something just comes from nothing, just kind of it does something something to me. 
So, you know, it's a matter of just putting my hands into a, another, another facet, another direction. I mean, Karen Clark had me throwing clay. <laughs> <laughs> and I did make something from it. So, you know, when those doors open, you just got to go through them and you'll find out, oh, oh, I, I like this. Or, oh, I can do this. Or, oh, you know, and that's how I jump from, the, you know, something that's flat to working in steel to working in, you know, uh, uh, copper to you just keep reaching, you keep doing and you keep and then you perfect it. And then you, you make it yours, your way. Or it just feeds your creativity. You know, sometimes you do something and it is so different than what you normally do. And it may, your work, your work increases and your creativity mm -hmm. opens up because you touch other kinds of, of, of artistry and, you know, just the surround it, 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 sure. that in itself is inspiring. You know, y'all trying to go to church, y'all trying to go to church up in here and it's not even. <laughs> We play, we play with art. That's right. Right. You know? right. So, BB, would you do me a favor and hold up the Florida picture? One of my arts committee members has asked me three times. And if we end this call and I didn't see it, is it that? Yeah, she wanted you to yeah, hold that up closer. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Got it? I think so. <laughs> Beautiful. Ellen, did you have any more questions? No, that was it for our uh, Q&A and chat questions. Okay, and I, and I just want to pivot back. Um, we spoke a little, I just want to go a little further with, um, well, two things, the, the sale of your art, the selling of your art, the promoting your art. The question is, how do you seek out opportunities to promote your art? and to sell it. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a, the time that we're in right now where we were all used to being able to exhibit outside the festivals and, 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 and that kind of thing, uh, do studio shows where you, you found the people and you went to the people and you showed them your work and you were doing one-on-one -on -one and you, know, you were able to reach out and touch is gone right now. So you kind of like platformed like this and you, 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 now you reach the people on another aspect. You reach the people via social media. You meet, reach the people via sending things out, Instagram, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and, I, and I'm limited with what I know with that, but I do know those two platforms have been, been working for me. You find you somebody young who can tell you other ways to get into um, sh sh um, reaching people in the, in the masses. Um, that's kind of like what has worked for me since we've been um, COVID, COVID bound. Um, we've done Facebook live shows uh, almost on the aspect of uh, the Black Home Shop Shopping Network, the Art Home Shopping Network, where I am the new Vanna White named Karen Buster. And I show my work every two weeks and say, you can get this and you can get that. But I like it because I'm able to talk back to the people on the other side of, of, of the screen. So this is where we have to go. And this is where we are right now until we can get back outside. Yeah, um, I, I say the same thing. And um, I've just been working a lot on commissions. Um, so if someone's not finding one thing, then I'm creating that. And I also still supply to the museums because the museums are open. And so I do have things in gift shops. And there are some galleries that are still open on the um, East Coast that I'm aware of that um, they will reach out um, and say that they're gonna be doing the show. And it could be a virtual show, but they're also um, opening and limiting their um, visits for people coming into the gallery spaces. So, I mean, there are a lot of avenues that are out there. The thing is, is that, um, you have to be inventive in how you're going to sell your work. 
Um, so it's Instagram, it's LinkedIn, it's TikTok, it's Facebook, it's um, it's LinkedIn, you know, so you have all of these platforms and it is a second job. And so you need to take that time out to make sure that you are taking the photos and uploading them and connecting with the clients because the most important part is that when you are being that we are not in the presence of someone, you still have to make that connection because people like to carry not only the peace with them, but they also want to carry that they met you, they talked to you, what you talked about, because these, we are, I, we are the living legends. And so these two things are written down, hopefully when it's passed down, they have the story to go on because it's just like us watching on PBS, the antique road show, somebody got a piece of art. And this is the paper and this is the receipt. And this is, you know, why, you know, I want to find out how much it is. And then this help them do the research to find out more about these people who are um, um, creating the art. Because I truly, me, I, I am a collector. I've been collecting since I was 21. And when I do collect the art, I want to know the story to this, this person. And if I can get them while they're still in this world, I'm so excited, you know, so I'm excited to see, you know, Woodrow Nash and Charles Bibbs and, you know, Poncho and Leroy Campbell, because these are people who are accessible, you know, and it's really sad when one of us pass away and we never got to do the connection. So um, when people buy art, you are taking a piece of our spirit into your home, you know, because, you know, it, we are because and we're so excited for you to have that piece you know so i think that's it i think that's all i have to say on that i could go on and on about that i don't have anything to add i think um karen and karen covered covered anything you know i think that it is about it, particularly in this day and time it is about creativity and innovation and just trying new things you know mm -hmm. um yeah Karen, Karen with a K touched uh, just a bit about the pandemic and, you know, you, have, you just have to do, we all have to do things differently than we did before, but has the, you know, you hear people, uh, you know, the buzzword is resilience, uh, the adversity that everyone is feeling with the pandemic and you know, race relations and has the pandemic uh, in any way impacted your creativity? Has it increased it? Or has it sort of made you, uh, I don't want to say depressed, but uh, you, you, maybe the motivation level isn't as strong or great? For myself, I think that it, it, it wanted to uh, make it uh, a depression, but it, I didn't have time for that. So, um, it's like you have some time now that you can concentrate on working without any outside noise. So for me, it has allowed me to um, really, really, really be in the studio and, and produce. Um, knowing what's going on outside, knowing that, okay, now I have to turn the news off because I got to go into my, my, my space, my my space, not that one, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's it's like it's like Kabibi said says to to me when when I'm able to produce something and you're able to take it and now you want to take something out of my spiritual temple and take it to your spirit spiritual temple, which is your home. You're not thinking about. The, the 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 pandemic you're not thinking about some of the things that could bring you down because art is is to make you feel whether it makes you feel happy about something or it makes it remind you of something that might have been a sad moment but you know you know the the best way to know what's going on in your in your home with your art is take it all off the wall if you like when you move and you take all the art off the wall it's so hollow. It you just you know, you know. I talk to my folk in here, and it's cool because 
some of them are talking back to me. So I think that I'm not the only person that does it. I'm sure the both of you guys can say you do the same thing because that's that's what it that's what it's supposed to do. So I think with the with with the, with the pandemic, you, you find a way to 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 flip it and 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 feel something that can make you to motivate you to to create. Also, I, artists know how to be how to go inside themselves. I mean, you know, it is not, I, I love people. I love crowds. I love festivals. I do, I do, I do. But I also know how to be in a space, in a zone and, and, and work with that. So I, I mean, yes, we are in a pandemic and yes, it has been a horrible time. And yes, the loss has been high and, and, you, you know, but to say that I'm stressed about being housebound, I, I cannot say that. That is, you know, I have not felt restricted by being in my home studio or in my garden or in my studio, my dye kitchen. I have not felt restricted by, by that. At, at, you know, I have felt that, oh, this quiet is good and there, there's less interruption and I can dig deeper, you know, for whatever the emotion is. Like like Karen says, it, it, it might not be a joyful emotion, but whatever that emotion, it's going to come out with some creativity, you know? Karen, did you want to, did you want to uh, speak on that? Thank you, now. Did you want to speak on the whole pandemic and? I don't know if you can hear me. Do you, me? Yes. Mm -hmm. What, what know, did you say? We were talking about the pandemic. We were asking um, mm -hmm. every artist to be reflective of how that has impacted you. Not so much that, you know, you're not able to go out and, and sell your goods, but how has it impacted you in terms of your creativity as an artist? Um, I think that it has actually made me work harder because I think that when you actually have a lot of quiet time, we all have quiet time in our studios that we like our solitude. But I think that when you are, when they say, okay, don't come outside, then you're like, wait a minute, hold on. I can't go outside. But um, I think that you do a lot of, um, Re self, um, not really internalizing, but I think you just go within yourself to pull out some of the um, good, you know, you know, like how, you know, like, or looking at what you've done in the past, did you make an impact? You know, how were you to others? You know, how would you want to make yourself better? What do you want to do for the future? Did you read all the books that you said you wanted to read in the past? You know, did you do the garden work? So I think that, um, I, you know, I think it just made me look within myself and make sure that I can be the best person that I can be. But it also made me make sure that um, I stay in contact with my family. Not that I want to talk to them 10, 000, 10 times a day, but I do. <laughs> but um, it makes you connect with the extended family that you may not have normally, you know, you talk to Thanksgiving right. and Christmas. Mm -hmm. exactly. But now mm -hmm. we're actually having games and and messenger on social media to get it to know each other better. I mean, and how, you know, and it's important because, you know, we sit here and we create this, you know, this legacy that we want to leave, but we don't make sure that we know all of the legacy that's behind us. I mean, that, you know, that came before us. So why are we not getting this information? And this is the most important part. And I have, um, from learning and researching, I've learned so much, not only about family, but, you know, about the area that the family, my family has come from and why we do what we do and, you know, all of that good stuff, you know, and when I, um, and with my students, I come back and have, you know, have them do the same thing to see what kind of stories they can convey onto their work and to just make them feel better about themselves, you know, whether it's a mountain scene, a mountain scene or, you know, flowers on a pot with some a sunrise, you know, it makes them, it gives them joy. 
beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could sit here and talk to you ladies probably for another hour or two. <laughs> uh, because I, I'm just in awe of the, the beautiful work that you do. Uh, your gift, because uh, artists, it, it is a gift from God that, that you have and, and it's, it's just beautiful. Uh, I'm going to ask our president, Linda B. Brown Kidd, um, if she, before we close out, we start bringing everything to a close. Uh, first, I'll let you, you ladies, if you want to say anything else um, in closing, if Linda has anything to ask the artists before we do our close out portion, because Linda's a creative herself. So I just wanted to give her an opportunity if she... Uh, She's been very quiet. If she had any questions um, for our guests, are you good, Linda? Hi, I, I don't have any questions. What I, I do have, and thank you for your compliments. I, I appreciate it. What I can say is that um, over my years, I've worked, I've never really worked in clay, but I, I've worked with that peak dying. Um, I paint, I do a lot of different things, but your dedication to your craft is so genuinely evident. I mean, it's just amazing to me that um, what you do brings you such joy, even when it's a tough time. And that to me speaks to your strength as women. And of course, your, the depth of your um, love of what you do. So I don't have any questions. I, I just want to commend you on sharing your gift with us today and really allowing us to talk to you on a deeper level. Because I think when we leave this space today, we'll all be enriched by everything that you all said, because I know I certainly am. And that, that's all I have, but um, I love you. I know some of you, but I love you all. And I appreciate you. you and keep doing what you're doing because it brings a level of joy to people that you have no idea what you do brings joy. So that's all I have. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Uh, uh, Karen with the K, Karen with the C, uh, Kabibi, does anyone have uh, any closing words, anything you want to say to the audience? Um, you did a marvelous job. You have marvelous, beautiful art and, and you each present it very well. And we thank you for that. I guess I got my mouth open, so I'll yeah. start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like to, I, I really like to thank the Minx organization um, for allowing this to happen. Uh, Sonia reaching out to me, then you're reaching out to me to say that, you know, let's go to another step in terms of uh, Women's Month and, and bringing um, um, the arts, female artists to this platform. Um, when I was asked about who did I think, you know, the, the artists that you see that have popped up on screen with me right now are three, three dear friends of mine. And I know that um, in its own light, we, we all think alike. So it's an opportunity for us to, to come together for you to see that there is a connection amongst um, black female artists that, you know, it's a matter of saying, I need you and it will become a part of what it needs to happen. So I wanna thank uh, Kabibi and I wanna thank Karen and I wanna thank- Thank you. Rihanna for also for um, saying yes when the, when I put put the question out there to him, so thank you guys, thank you, links. Um, it was great. It was great. So I, I'm gonna stop because you know I can go. I, I'd like to echo that. I'd like to say, you know, Karen Y. Buster, thank you for inviting me. I would like to say, Sonia Ellen and Linda, thank you for the support to you know and the effort to kind of glue this thing together and make it happen. Thank you um, for the visionary work for the Lynx organization and just doing this thing that uplifts, um, you know, artistry and African-American women in this way. So I, I just, you know, I'm just grateful. Thank you for 
um, for all that you do. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And thank you, uh, Karen and Karen and Brianna for allowing me to stand shoulder to shoulder with you, you know, and feel that energy heart to heart, mind to mind, body to body and spirit to spirit. Ooh. <laughs> well, all I'm going to do is say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. Thank you, everybody. And, and, and of course we, we thank, um, I'm going to say the four of you, even though Brianna isn't here with us today, but she did a beautiful job with that videotape. Uh, we definitely have to thank all our, our attendees, our guests that came on. Um, we will, uh, this was recorded, so we will uh, probably put it on, no, not probably, we'll put it on YouTube. So I'll make sure I'll send it to, to you ladies so that you can see it. Uh, of course, I have to thank the members of my chapter, the Atlantic City, New Jersey chapter of the Lynx, because they are always, always, always supportive. Uh, thank Ellen. And you didn't see Sheila, but Sheila was monitoring the um, uh, Facebook uh, questions. But uh, to my arts facet, I have a wonderful group of ladies, and I'm just going to take a minute to call out their names because they deserve the recognition. Uh, Ellen Bailey, who you not met, uh, Lena Fulton, Kay Jackson, Katora Jackson, Mary Anwuka, Diane McCoy, Sheila Pierce Williams, who was one of our uh, guests on uh, that helped help us out today, Carol Reynolds, Laquetta Small, Stephanie Thomas, Sharon Warren, our programming chair, uh, who is always super supportive, Vicki Small, and of course the technician who was just wonderful and tolerates me, texting him, calling him. Today he said, Sonia, just, just take a breath and chill out. So I did, so that, that was great. So uh, thank you all, thank you, thank you, thank you. Kisses, hugs, and Linda, over to you. Well, one thing I wanna close um, to our programming chair, Vicki Scott, and um, the members of our chapter, and I know that Mr. Chap and we'll be scrolling something at the end. So take a minute to look at it. And I'd like to thank you, Ms. Donya G. Harris, for your hard work with this project because um, it's not easy getting everybody to come together, especially when we're artists. And I, I'm gonna put me in that box right now. We're artists, but all of us have um, something to share in that realm. So. Just thank you and your committee for your hard work and thank you to the Atlantic City, New Jersey chapter of the Lynx Incorporated for your support of this project and to all of our Facebook friends, we thank you for joining us this afternoon. And Linda, I, I called him by name, but his business is Coastal Media Solutions. That is thank Mr. Uh, Chapman's business name. Thank you to Mr. Chapman as well. Thank you.